What does a show about an unorthodox country girl babysitter taking care of spoiled rich kids have in common with a show about a teenage superhero balancing his adventures with his awkward social life? Both of them take place in New York City, and I guess they air it on the same channel. Sounds good enough for a crossover to me! This review was requested by Class Act Media on Patreon. Go donate, it really helps me out, and check out my merch on sale now. But before we talk about some superhero collaborations, I want to thank this video's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. What can I say about Surfshark? Well, it's fast and easy to use, allowing you to connect to the server that offers the best speed by default. It's just as easy to install and can be used on unlimited devices, and plenty more features beyond the basics. With Surfshark, you can watch shows in style because it lets you bypass geo restrictions to get the 15 largest Netflix libraries, and lets you access limited streaming services like Hulu and Disney Plus no matter where in the world you are. You can even check out YouTube videos blocked in your country. Your safety and security is also a top priority by protecting your personal data with uncrackable encryption and the most secure VPN protocols. Surfshark also provides IPs and DNS leak protection so no one can track where you're connecting from and protects your data from being logged. If this sounds like a good deal to you, get Surfshark VPN at the link in the description and enter the promo code GODZILLA for 83% off and 3 extra months for free. Who was this for? Why did this happen? There are obviously exceptions to the rule, but I assume the key demographics for teen girl sitcom and animated punchy superhero are generally pretty fucking different. Was Disney trying to reduce the gap by getting the Spider-Man audience interested in Jesse and vice versa? If that was the goal, then this crossover special fails miserably, because honestly I don't think it's a good representation of what either show has to offer. I'm in a very, 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 very small minority of people who actually don't hate Ultimate Spider-Man. I mean, compared to what came before it, it's poo-poo caca, but on its own merit, and with the context of what they couldn't do, it has its moments. The character designs are cool, the animation is pretty slick, still more or less understands Spider-Man as a character when he's not doing this weird Ferris Bueller bullshit. Immature, I know, but it felt so good. And it tried something new, introducing obscure or underrated characters to new viewers through the lens of a lighthearted crossover. I consider this the brave and the bold of Spidey cartoons. And for whatever faults it has, it's certainly better than what came after it. All that being said... Did you just slime me? Sorry, but you got in my way. In fact, if you hadn't cut in line, you wouldn't be here in the first place. I hate Drake Bell's Spider-Man voice. He has zero range and delivers every line exactly the same regardless of context. Well, on the other hand, Jesse is... Uh, not really my thing. I mean, I was pretty into Zack and Cody as a kid and even caught the off episode of That's So Raven or Hannah Montana at 3 a.m. when nothing else was on because I was homeschooled and decided my own bedtime. I thought those shows were alright, even if I don't really care to revisit them in my old age. I think Jesse fits right along with that. If I was flipping channels late at night, YouTube and Netflix weren't a thing that exists, and I was bored out of my mind, I'd probably watch a few episodes back to back. In preparation for this review, I checked out the first episode and it felt pretty standard for a Disney sitcom. Not every joke landed, but every once in a while it got a chuckle out of me. But I can't figure out why in God's name someone decided these two needed to be mashed together when it's such an awkward and uncomfortable fit. Go do your homework. Uh, you're not the boss of me. Actually, I kind of am. Ooh, someone's about to flip the table. <laughs> this is in the same universe as Galactus. Jesse certainly isn't an action show by any means, nor is Spider-Man a situation of comedy. Alright, alright, let's actually talk about the special itself. Well, for some reason, Spider-Man and the cast of The Mick But For Kids end up in a museum late at night on Halloween. Random, but okay. The rambunctious Chirins accidentally dislodge a sword from one of the exhibits and summon King Arthur's sister from the legend, Morgan Le Fay. Is the sword King Arthur's sword? I don't know, they never say. Morgan Le Fay wants to take the sword for herself and use it to take over the world. I seem to recall her motivation involving a bit more incest, but I guess we'll just forget about that part. Also, her design was better in Justice League. Oh look, another character appearing in both Marvel and DC things. We'll talk about that later. So anyway, she makes all the exhibits in the museum come to life and attack our heroes like that Ben Stiller movie, until eventually they put the sword back in and she disappears or dies or whatever. Children! I just love children! A few questions immediately spring to mind about all this. Like, why is Jesse inexplicably a swashbuckling sword fighting badass? Is it, are just people that are not from the city like that? Why am I not like that? Is the sword making her do that? Is that just a thing I didn't know about her from the show since I only skimmed through one episode? 
Why does the demon spell thing turn this security guard into Jack-O-Lantern? I guess maybe it's like an inverted version of what happened to Jack-O-Lantern from the comics where he took over the Hobgoblin persona and eventually made a deal with a demon during the Inferno event to get super strength and demonic powers which resulted in him splitting off into Demo-Goblin. No, no, it, it's just, it's because he'd look good as a villain in a Halloween special. They didn't think about it that hard. The kids over here seem to all get some kind of magic upgrade to their costumes from the spell, but none of them do anything. They just stand around and quip while Jesse and Spidey are doing all the fighting. You know, I saw something similar on the street in Jaipur, but that involved cobras. Yeah, but not giant cobras, right? No, but cobras. What was the joke here? He just repeated himself. What? And lastly, why is Jesse such a grouchy asshole to Spider-Man? All he's doing is trying to help. You really have this under control. You sure you don't have any superpowers? I did okay, didn't I? <laughs> I guess not all heroes are super. Jeez, don't break your arm patting yourself on the back, lady. She and the rest of the kids act like they don't even know who he is. How do you move to New York City in this universe and not at least hear something about him? All in all, it's ultimately <laughs> pretty innocuous and boring. It's not so terrible I hate it or anything, I just don't see any value in it. I feel like it was a bad idea executed badly. The characters don't mesh well, but oddly enough, cringy voice acting from teen sitcom stars is not out of place in this show. Front-facing Phineas! Front-facing Phineas! It's my headcanon that this other shameless crossover happened to Drake Bell Spider-Man literally the next day. You know, this one feels a lot less forced. Phineas and Ferb Mission Marvel is a better example of a crossover with a non-superhero property, because at least all the basics are there to mesh well. Phineas and Ferb have crazy impossible adventures where your imagination is the limit. There's a hero, there's a supervillain, there's super science, and sometimes a battle against evil. It's not just a bunch of normal kids that hang out in an apartment that looks like a key lit TV set all day. Phineas and Ferb is a show about two boys on summer vacation who use their imagination and absurd intellect to build just about anything they want each day of the summer, while their older sister tries to narc on them. Also, randomly, their pet platypus is a secret agent and fights a mad scientist for some B-plot action. It's a funny show with a lot of heart, but what put me off to it as a kid is how repetitive the episodes tend to be. They all sort of follow the same formula, and, you know, this crossover is no exception. I suppose it's not a show you watch for the plot, it's just for the comedy and the charm that comes from the single plot they reuse. It's the House MD of kids' cartoons. They only got one episode for ten seasons straight, but it's a damn good episode. In this here animated adventure, an accident involving Perry the Platypus, as well as Phineas and Ferb's current project, accidentally depowers a handful of Marvel heroes. Hulk's strength is sapped, Spidey's webs and stickiness don't work, Thor can't lift his hammer despite his worthiness, and Iron Man's armor locks up. I'm a nitpick here a little cause he's my favorite, but Spider-Man's webs aren't a power nor an electronic device, those should still work. But anyway, that creates a conflict where the heroes can no longer take down a group of villains, including Peter Stormare as Whiplash and Danny Trejo as Venom. What random but interesting casting. So the Avengers head to Phineas and Ferb's house to ask for some assistance in getting their powers back, since that ray that zapped them originated from a very distinct looking satellite. There's a few gags in the middle with Dr. Doof and Schmertz hanging out with the bad guys, the heroes getting their powers swapped around like that Fantastic Four movie no one saw, and then a big battle for the conclusion. I'm a nitpick here a little cause he's my favorite, but Spider-Man didn't need the Hulk's powers to do that, he could do that normally. Be nice dear, he's been studying abroad. Really? Which broad? What's your name? Candace. a lot of funny comedy bits here and there that are really indicative of the Phineas and Ferb sense of humor. And it was nice to hear something a little more highbrow after Yes But Cobras. Hey, wait a minute. If there's anything I really don't like about the special is that the Marvel heroes are an extremely small part of it and the Phineas and Ferb cast takes center stage. There's a lot of time devoted to this conflict where the older sister Candace keeps trying to help out but makes things worse and then gets yelled at for it. Then a long musical number about the girls feeling excluded from superhero fun times. You know who is really excluded from superhero fun times? The superheroes, man! Spidey has like less than 10 lines of dialogue in this 40 minute thing. It's more like a standard Phineas and Ferb episode featuring a bit part by the Avengers than an even half and half. Which is fine, I guess, because, you know, they stuck with what they do best. I also wish the heroes didn't spend such a big chunk of the running time powerless, but I suppose there'd be no story if they weren't nerfed. They just fly in and curb stomp faceless Nazi man and pals Ultimate Alliance style like they did at the beginning. It's not a bad crossover and it's got both a lot of funny moments and nice little Marvel Universe winks and nods for the fanboys if you look close. 
I wouldn't exactly say it's required viewing for any Marvel fans, but it's still worth checking out if you'd wondered what it would be like to see these brands bump into each other a little. I wanted this list to be longer and feature more bizarre crossovers between superhero cartoons and non-superheroes, but frankly I was having a hard time finding any more beyond these two. Honorable mention goes to the five separate times Batman and Scooby-Doo have hung out. Once as a full animated movie from the 70s, oh my god, Velma's lips! A short follow-up episode of the Scooby series, and then decades later in an anthology episode of Batman Brave and the Bold, hosted by Batmite, a show that's nothing but crossovers. This one is particularly impressive because it's not even the Brave and the Bold Batman, it's specifically the one they already met in the 70s again. This short segment is really cleverly animated to mimic the limited character movement and lip sync of the aged original crossover. Also, Weird Al is there. That's not really that out of place for Scooby-Doo, he's always hanging out with celebrities. The real icing on the cake is that Batmite is just as much of a nerd as the rest of us and occasionally comments on the animation errors and even uses his powers to make things more interesting. When this show was made, Batman couldn't even throw a punch! Lucky for us, I possess near-infinite reality-warping magical powers! <laughs> Holy shit, he even allows Shaggy to use 1% of his power! What's even weirder is this Brave and the Bold show came back after its cancellation in 2011, seven years later. That's pretty cool considering this wasn't necessarily anyone's favorite Batman show, even though I think it's awesome. And getting these things revived, even temporarily, is nearly impossible. Now this time, it's for sure the Brave and the Bold Batman, but he hasn't met the gang before so they don't know each other? Are these now separate timelines? Well, there goes my theory that every Scooby-Doo thing is canon to the same universe. Eh, wouldn't make sense anyway. But yeah, I dig this one. In fact, I'd say this is the best crossover on the list here. It has the best action, it has a perfectly even balance of Scooby-Doo and Batman stuff, and doesn't feel forced. It also has the best writing because there's so many moments that legitimately made me laugh. What are you doing here? I go wherever puppet-related crime rears its ugly head. I don't want to spoil it a whole lot because I think you should just absolutely check this one out. My biggest takeaway from it was that Brave and the Bold was underrated as hell and I miss it dearly. I wish they'd do more occasional reunion movies like this one. Imagine every few years the B&B &B crew comes back with Aquaman, Plastic Man, and Diedrich Bader's Batman for another random crossover. Could be cool, but I have this feeling this is going to be the last we see of this take on Batman since no one was really begging for this, and its existence feels like a really happy accident in the first place. But I'll go on record and say that I want to see more of this series. All the other ones ran their course and Beware was underwhelming. If they ever revive a Batman show full stop, this one is my pick. This special is fantastic, go take a look. But let's say you don't care much for the Silver Age Love Letter Batman series and prefer Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill's take on Batman and the Joker. Well, you're covered too, because in Scooby-Doo and Guess Who, a show with a new crossover every episode, Batman meets the gang again! Three separate timelines of this! It's a multiversal constant! Is this the DCAU Batman? All the character designs look pretty Bruce Timmish. Yo, Watchtower, I'm asking you boys a question! Whatever, who cares? It's a fun episode where Darker Batman and the gang both solve the mystery of who kidnapped Alfred, who has some kind of Spaceballs level of familial attachment to Daphne. What are you doing here? How do you know Alfred? If you were on your way here when you passed us, how did we get here first? And where'd you park the Batmobile? I... Uh, I... Batman's relegated to a bit part while a pretty standard Scooby episode plays out with him occasionally jumping in. It's not as good as the Brave and the Bold one, but it's still pretty funny and worth checking out too. Also, I accidentally spoiled the mystery already in this paragraph, but maybe no one noticed. You know what, now that I think about it, Scooby-Doo meets Batman isn't that weird of a crossover either, since they both tend to hang out with everyone else. You can trace everything back to Scooby-Doo or Batman. At this point, I'm sure you could play some bizarre version of Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon with the amount of crossovers that have happened over the years. Like, for example, Marvel Zombies vs. Army of Darkness has Ash Williams pal around with various Marvel heroes in a gruesome zombie tale, but he's also been at odds with Freddy Krueger and Jason Voorhees and even Darkman. Jason Voorhees is canonically a deadite from the Evil Dead universe, but both him and Freddy have fought each other and the cast of Mortal Kombat. Jason has also met Leatherface of the Texas Chainsaw series once before this. Mortal Kombat has crossed over with DC, as well as the Predator and Alien Xenomorph, who have crossed over with each other, and Witchblade, and the Darkness, and even Judge Dredd, who has met Batman a few times. Jackie Astacato of the Darkness himself has met Batman, Superman, the Hulk, Vampirella, Wolverine, Doctor Strange, Ghost Rider, and Tomb Raider in his time too. 
And also, Batman, Superman, and Green Lantern have all had run-ins with the Predator and Xenomorph. Not to mention Robocop and Terminator have battled before, and once again in the Mortal Kombat tournament. Terminator has also fought the Alien and the Predator before himself. The Predator has fought Tarzan. Also, we're forgetting to mention that Marvel and DC have crossed over multiple times with each other. The X-Men have been beamed aboard the Starship Enterprise and met Kirk and Spock. But Star Trek has also bumped into the Legion of Superheroes in the future of the DC Universe, as well as the Doctor from Doctor Who. DC has also paired its heroes with the Looney Tunes, who have met with the Disney animated characters and Roger Rabbit, who have, through the House of Mouse, met all the characters of the various Walt Disney movies like Tarzan, whom I can only assume is the same one who faced the Predator. These Disney princesses have also met Vanellope from Wreck-It Ralph, and her friend Ralph is friends with Sonic, Bowser, Pac-Man, who is actually friends with Dig Dug in Pac-Man World, and M. Bison. Sonic and Mario appear in the Super Smash Bros. series, as well as that one time they competed in the Olympics, which means they're buddies with Solid Snake and Steve from Minecraft. Pac-Man was in Street Fighter X Tekken. Speaking of Street Fighter, a few of those guys had encounters with Marvel characters in Marvel vs. Capcom, which also included various Resident Evil characters, Dante from DMC, and all these other guys! Dante's evil twin brother, Dino, Dante name only, was also in PlayStation All-Stars alongside Nathan Drake, Cole McGrath, Isaac Clark, Heihachi from Tekken, Big Daddy from Bioshock, and Kratos! Kratos has also been in the Soul Calibur series, which has in the past featured Darth Vader, Yoda, Starkiller, Link from Zelda, and Spawn! Spawn and Kratos have also both fought in the Mortal Kombat tournament, Spawn has hung out with Batman, Batman's hung out with Ninja Turtles, Ninja Turtles were in Injustice, Ninja Turtles also met the Power Rangers, and also the other Ninja Turtles who met the other Ninja Turtles! One time the Punisher mistook Archie for a crime boss and attempted to murder him, but Archie has also been stalked by a predator, so he's used to this stuff. The Punisher and Eminem teamed up to defeat Barracuda! We gotta remember Scooby-Doo! Scooby-Doo has gone on an adventure with Batman, Johnny Bravo, Teen Titans Go, Dean and Sam of Supernatural, and the Harlem Globetrotters, who've also appeared in the Little Nicky and Futurama series! which has gone back in time to meet The Simpsons. The Simpsons, of course, have had cameos from King of the Hill, The Critic, The X-Files, 24, and then Family Guy. Everything is connected to everything. Everything is in the same universe.